Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the house of the Lord today. We appreciate your presence. And you listening out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up, it can be a real blessing to you. And it'll be tape number 206. If you'd like to have it, just write in and say, Preacher Edward, send me tape number 206 and include a gift of $3 or more to help take care of the radio expense and we'll get the tape right in the mail to you. Now, don't forget to re request your calendar if you'd like to have one of our beautiful calendars. We now have them. They're available. I'd be glad to send you a calendar at your request. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now, if you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 17 for the reading of God's Word today. Luke chapter 17. Now, this week being uh, Thanksgiving week this past week, we dealt with some scripture here Wednesday night. I want to reread today. I want to enlarge upon it. We kindly touched on it Wednesday night, but we want to find out something about where those other nine people were. And I'm speaking on the subject, where are the nine? We find 10 people here involved, only one turned back to glorify Jesus and to thank him for what he had done, but where are the nine? Let's see if we can locate them today. In Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 11, it's page 1099 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. While you're turning there, I would like to say we do have a few original Schofield Reference Bibles on hand. I try to order a few to have them available for you that would like to get one. We can let you have them at a saving. If you're interested in the Schofield Bible uh, pertaining to Christmas, why well, let me know. And some of you in the radio listening audience might be wondering what you could get for your parents or your grandparents or some shut-in for Christmas. Have you ever thought about getting them a, a cassette tape player where they can get these tape and other good tape and listen to the music, the singing, and the preaching? That'd be a good Christmas gift for anyone that don't have a cassette tape player because there's many good tapes available now by different preachers and singers it can be a real inspiration to shut-in people or elderly people. It can be a blessing to them. Now Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, and he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorifying God. And he fell down on his face and his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, of course, just closing out on Thanksgiving week, we had many things to be thankful for. And if you notice here in this scripture, you have ten people. And Jesus did the same for all ten. But only one of the ten turned back and glorified God and came and bowed down and thanked him for what he had done. You have ten lepers here. They had a disease that was incurable. In those days when a person contracted disease called leprosy, that meant he would die. Like the disease of AIDS today. Whatever a person contracts AIDS, that's it. You won't be here much longer. And so it was with leprosy in those days. And there they, many of them died and they were abandoned. They were placed in a colony to themselves and no one was allowed to come near. Whenever they see someone approaching them, they would raise their hands and begin to cry, unclean, unclean. So someone would not come upon them unaware because that, that disease was so contagious. And so these 10 men all had leprosy. They lived together. They were miserable. They saw that terrible disease eating their bodies away day after day, night after night. 
and they had no hope until they heard about Jesus coming on the scene. And of course, when they heard that he could heal, they were deeply concerned about it. They thought there might be some hope for them. I want you to notice, first of all, they had the same disease. You'll find that in verse 12. They all had leprosy. They had the same disease. Leprosy in the Bible is a type of sin. And so Jesus said, We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's none good, no, not one. Therefore, all of us need to be saved or we won't go to heaven when we die. And so they all had the same disease. Secondly, they all stood afar off in the same place according to verse 12. And that's a picture of our people are far off from God, not near God until they get saved. It's also a picture of the Gentiles who are far off, now made nigh by his blood, according to Ephesians 2.13. Number three, they all cried to the same person. All ten of these men cried to the same person. There they were in need, and they cried to him in verse 13. Then notice again number four, they all cried for the same thing in verse 13. If you notice there, they all cried for mercy. Lord, have mercy on us. They cried to Jesus for him to have mercy on them. And that's the only cry or only prayer a sinner can make is, is to cry for mercy. So they said, have mercy on us. Number five, they were all given the same prescription. Every one of them received the same prescription. In verse 14, he told them, go show yourself to the priest. And so, of course, they started on their way. Every one of them, all ten, had to go and show themselves unto the priest. The reason for that is that was required in Old Testament law that they must do that. And Jesus sent them to the priest to show themselves unto the priest. Number six, they all got the from that terrible disease called leprosy. Then number seven, only one is thankful for what was done for him. You notice verses 15 and 16, only one out of the ten was thankful enough to turn around, come back, bow down before Jesus, fall down in the dirt, and thank him for what he's done. Now we just passed Thanksgiving week. I wonder how many people this past week paused long enough to get on their knees and thank God for God's many blessings. We are very unthankful people, I'm afraid. And I'm afraid that's one of the great sins of the church today and one of the great sins of this nation. We're not thankful enough. We're living in the greatest country in all the world, the most powerful and the richest nation in the world to its size. And we have food in abundance. We have clothes to wear, shelter under which to live. We have many, many blessings that people don't have in other lands. And I wonder how many of us really stop long enough to get on our knees and thank God for what we have. Thanksgiving morning, I went down into my study I read the word of God. I fell down on my knees. And I thank the Lord for many, many things. God had been so good to us. And you ought to do that not only on Thanksgiving. You ought to do that every day. You ought to thank God for what you have and for the blessings. Now I'm going to throw this in for good measure. If you, whenever you sit down to eat your food, if you don't bow your head and thank God for that food, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. If you had to live in some of these nations today that don't have sufficient food to eat to take care of their bodies, then you'd be thankful for what you have. I've traveled in many foreign countries. I've traveled in at least five in during World War II. I've been to the Holy Land Middle East 12 times. I've seen people on starvation. And I said when I came out of World War II and saw some of the need in foreign lands, I'd never, never grumble about what I have to eat here in this country. We throw away more food in America than it would take to feed many, many hungry and starving nations. God has blessed us beyond measure. How much longer God will do that, I don't know. But we ought to thank God we were born in a great land like America. And God has blessed this nation beyond measure. We ought to thank God for that. Now we find ten men healed. Nine goes on their way. Only one turns back to thank the Lord for what God had done. I want us to see if we can kind of locate those fellows here in the way of a type or a symbol and see if we can apply it to our hearts today. Let's take number one, one of the nine. We find him sitting at home with the family. He says, well, I'm going to sit at home with my family. 
I can't get my wife to go to church. I can't get my children to go, so I'll just stay at home with the family. Now you find some like that today. They put that up as an excuse. Now we find in Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 24, some men there invited to a supper. One had bought a piece of ground, and he could not come. Another had bought five yoke of oxen, and he could not come. One had married a wife, therefore he could not come. But they didn't realize that God could take everything they had away in one stroke. Now God did that for Job. Job was a rich man, a wealthy man, a righteous man, a man that had been blessed, but God took everything he had, allowed the devil to do it at one stroke. Now, did it ever occur to you that we could lose everything we have at one stroke, so to speak? Don't ever put your family up as an excuse as why you don't come to church. I know many times it's hard on wives to come to church when their husbands won't come, but you have to appreciate women that'll do that. They'll come right on to the house of God. They'll bring their children. They'll be in the place of worship. It might be the means of them keeping their children out of hell. And it might be the means of someday reaching that lost husband for God. One day God may let you win him to Jesus. One day he might decide to come to the house of God and get saved. Now the reason people don't come to church is they're not saved. You find some that are backslidden, a few, but most of them never slid forward. They have no concern for God, no concern for the Bible, no concern for prayer. And that's why you can't get them to the house of God. It's very hard to get unsaved people to church. After all, God told us to go after them and win them to God. You can't find in the Bible where God said for that sinner to go to church. God said for the Christian to go and then for the Christian to win that sinner to God, then he would go to church. Now, if you can get him to the house of God, well and good, wonderful. But as a general rule, you can't get him to the house of God because he's not a saved individual. Many of them got their names on the church roll. Many of them been baptized. Many of them made a profession back years ago, but they stopped short of salvation. They were not saved. They're still lost and they're still without God. Don't ever use your family as an excuse to stay away from God's house. We find number one doing that. Let's move on to number two. Number two is one asleep in the garden. The Bible says in Luke chapter 26 and verse 40, He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Here we find the disciples asleep at a tragic hour. If there had ever been a time when these men should have been wide awake, it was then, but they were sound asleep. I contend if there's ever a time when God's people ought to be wide awake, it is now. I'm speaking right now through medium of radio, no doubt, to church members out in the radio listening audience. They laid in the bed this morning sleeping. Instead of getting up and going to Sunday school and coming to the house of God, they lay there sleeping, sound asleep when they ought to be getting ready to worship God on the Lord's day. Sunday is a day to worship God in. God expects us to do that. You get up, you go to your job on Monday and Tuesday and, and so on through the week. And then on Sunday, you say, well, I'm just going to lay in bed today and take it easy. You don't appreciate what God's done for you. You don't appreciate the fact that God's blessed you. You don't appreciate the fact God's been good to your family. God can wipe out you and everything you've got in one stroke if you want to do that. You never think about that. And so don't sleep on the job. I wake up and on Sunday morning, let that be a day when you're sure to get up on time and be found at the place of worship in God's house. You ought to do that. But one of the nine is sound asleep. Now I'm afraid today we have too many church members sound asleep on the job and the need to wake up. Wake up and serve the Lord. Be faithful in serving God because the coming of Christ is at hand. I believe with all of my heart the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Many of these great signs we have today in the elements, the weather, and so forth. And we have these tornadoes and hurricanes and, and volcano eruptions and earthquakes and things of this type. That is all a sign of the time. God said these would happen in the end time. The Bible said there'd be pestilence in the end time. And this term disease they call aid is a pestilence. That's what it is. God said it would be in the end time. They may never find a cure for that disease. They'll never find a cure for cancer. They may never find a cure for that. That disease may wipe out a great uh, a population upon the earth, a great large portion of the population of the earth. But it may do it. Who knows? I hope not. But it may. 
You know, there was a black uh, plague hit, hit Europe hundreds of years ago that uh, just about wiped out Europe over there. Now, beloved, this thing could do that. I hope it won't. There's a lot of people afraid, a lot of great medical doctors afraid that might be what's coming upon us. Who knows? God said it'd be pestilence in the end time and it's coming upon us. So we found one sound asleep, just like some of the backslidden church members right now sitting in their home, still in the bed, had the name on the church roll, ought to be in God's house, well able to do so, but they're just lying there on the bed, sitting there, and unconcerned about the things of God. How sad. And one of these was not thankful enough to turn back and praise God and thank God. He sound asleep. Let's move on to another. Number three, we find that one is warming himself by the devil's fire. In Luke chapter 22, verse 55, And when they had killed a fire in the midst of the hall, and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. Now here we find a man warming himself by the devil's fire. It was cold in those days. And they had brought Jesus into the uh, Pilate's home then, the judgment home. They brought Jesus in. And then uh, uh, Simon Peter went in with them. And, and there was a fire there. And he sat there uh, by the fire with the devil's crowd. The devil's crowd had brought Jesus in to crucify him. And we find uh, Simon Peter warming himself by the devil's fire. And he denied that he was a disciple. He was not willing to break with the crowd he wanted to be with the crowd. He's not willing to take a stand for God. When a little maiden came and accused him of being one of them, he said, I'm not one of his disciples. And there he continued to warm himself at the devil's fire. Now you have a lot of people like that today. They want to go to heaven when they die. They want the blessings of God, but they're not willing to break with the world, not willing to break with the devil's crowd out here. They want to associate with them. You must remember, in order to have God's best, Get away from the devil's fire and quit warming yourself at the devil's fire. And when you do that, then you can have the blessings of God. So we find one of them warming himself at the devil's fire. Then we go on searching for another. We're looking for number four and we find him down at the hog pen. Remember there were nine of them. Number four is at the hog pen. In Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 17, we find a man living down there after the flesh, after, not after the spirit. Now, this boy decided he wanted to leave home. He decided he knew more than his parents. Kind of like a man one time is called his teenage boy in and said, Son, uh, I want to have a little talk with you. You're getting up now in your teens, and I need to talk with you a little bit about the things of life. He said, Fine, Dad, what do you want to know? Well, a lot of them take that attitude. They, they think they have the answer. They know more than their parents, and they're not willing to listen. And evidently, this young boy said, Well, I, I, I want to leave home. I think it's better uh, down in the faraway country. If I stay at home, then I've got to obey my daddy and do what he wants to do and, and, uh, and hang around here. And I think it's better down the road. I believe I'll just get my inheritance, what's coming to me later on. And then I'll take off and have a good time. And that he did. He received his inheritance, told his dad goodbye, and he took off. wasn't long until he'd wasted all of his substance and routeless living. Man, he lived it up. He was having a good time. And he left the father's house, a good warm home in which to sleep, good food to eat, good fellowship. And he left that. He was traveling on. Now, he had a great gang of friends. When they found out he had money, boy, he had more friends he could shake a stick at. And he was moving on, spending his money right and left. And when he realized what had happened, he spent all of his money... And he looked around for his friends, and he couldn't find the one of them. Now, that's what you call your farewell of friends. Now, there's some people that'll be your friend if you have something for them. But if you don't, they'd all know you. You'll find that in every phase of life. Young boy one time had a beautiful automobile, a little money to spend, and didn't know he did have so many friends until they found out he had the beautiful sport automobile. And he had more friends he could get in the car. And one day he wrecked his car, got into trouble, threw him in jail. And then he found out he didn't have any friends at all. Where were those fellows that stood by him and, and rode with him, spent money on him, carried him to ride? Where were they? Well, they didn't care anything about him now. He had wrecked his car, spent his money, and now he's in jail. And let him get out the best way he can. That's the way this world will treat you. This world is like that. This world is not like God's people. God's people will stand by each other, but not this world. This world loves its own, and then when you get into trouble, it'll turn its back on you and let you get out the best way you can. 
And so we find one of these fellows down at the hog pen, not thankful for being healed of his leprosy. He's in a faraway land eating the husk of swine that's eat, and so therefore he's in a faraway land. Let's move on and check on number five. We find number five in the whale's belly. We find in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17, Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now why was Jonah in the whale's belly? He was there because of disobedience. God had called him and told him to go to Nineveh and preach to the Ninevites. He didn't like the Ninevites. Those Assyrians were enemies of Israel, and he didn't like it. He hated them with a passion. And God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, a large city, the capital of Assyria, and I want you to go there and preach to those Ninevites. He said, I don't want to go. And he headed in another direction, and God caused a big fish to swallow him up. A storm came, and it threw him overboard, and the fish swallowed him up. Now, why did that fish swallow that man? He was disobedient, that's why. He was disobedient to God. And that's why we find number five today. There may be some of you, you're in a whale's belly as it were because of your disobedience to God. The only way you're coming out of that whale's belly is to be willing to do what God wants you to do. There's a lot of people, they know what God wants them to do. They know the call of God. They know their talent. They know their ability. And they're just not going to do it. They, they just backslide on God, refuse to do what God wants them to do. One of these days when they end up in the whale's belly, They'd be glad to do what God wants them to do. Now this man here disobeyed God. He knew what God wanted him to do. God wanted him to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go. He didn't want to do it. He didn't like the situation. It wasn't what he wanted. And so he said, well, I just, I just won't go. It's not what I want. It's not my way. It's not my idea. And I just won't go. God said, we'll see about that, young man. And God created a situation whereby after God got through with him, he was glad to go. Now, if you know what God wants you to do, and you can do it and have the ability to do it, you better do it. Don't one of these days when God gets to thrashing you out real good, you'll be glad to do what God wants you to do. No doubt there's some out in the radio listening audience oh, right now in the whale's belly. You're in a terrible mess. You're out there all tangled up in the affairs of this world. You're out there suffering because you're backsliding on God. You're in a whale's belly. And the only way you're coming out is get right with God and do what God wants you to do and find your place in the house of God and serve the Lord as you should. And then that whale will dump you out. That's the only way. Let's move on and see if we can locate number six. We find number six under the juniper tree. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down on the juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it's not enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Here we find Elijah Tishbite, a man that God had blessed, a man that God had used him to chop the heads off the false prophets. And now he's discouraged under the juniper tree, sitting down, all discouraged. He said, I'm the only one alive. I'm no better than my father's. They have been killed. I might as well go ahead and die because I'm about the only one left. And God told him, he said, Elijah, there's 6,000 not uh, about the need of bail yet. And, and here you are out here discouraged and sitting on the juniper tree. Why, well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I've blessed you. I've used you. You've had mighty power. And now you're sitting there pouting, all discouraged because things are not going your way. Elijah, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. One of the greatest tools the devil uses on Christian people is get them discouraged. When he tries everything else under heaven and it doesn't work, he reaches back, he gets tool number one. And that tool number one is the tool of discouragement. And he takes that tool and he starts working on God's people. If he can get you discouraged, he's got you just where he wants you. He's got you in an act of disobedience. He's got you thinking wrong. He has you doing wrong. He has you acting wrong. He has you being wrong and not realizing it because you're discouraged. And the devil's defeated more of God's people through discouragement than any other one thing. If he can discourage you and get you to sit at home on Sunday and not come to the house of God, he'll do that. If he can discourage you and get you to not take part in the work of God, he'll do that. That's his tool. That's his method. That's the devil for you. He'll use that. 
He'll discourage you. If he can get you to throw up your hands and quit and say, well, I'm just not going to have any more to do with the work of God or going to church or serving God or taking a part in the work of the Lord. That's discouraging. He'll use that tool on you. That's tool number one. If he can't get you any other way, he'll fall back on that one. And that's the one he's really conquered a lot of God's people with, the tool of discouragement. There have been a lot of church members get up on Sunday morning and say, well, I don't think I'll go to church today. I don't get anything out of it. I, I don't, I know about what's going to happen tonight. I, I think I'll just, I stay at home. And you get discouraged, you backslide on God. And that's the devil doing that. He's working on you. He's keeping you from doing what you can for God and being faithful. So Elijah was discouraged. We find number six, discouraged, one of those fellows. Then we come to number seven. And we find him down in Sodom and Gomorrah. In uh, Genesis chapter 19, we find Lot down there. He had uh, broken away from Uncle Abraham. He's down in Sodom and Gomorrah. He entered into politics. And became mayor of the city and let the devil get his whole family. And he's sitting down there with those sodomites and listening to their filthy conversation day after day. And God had to take him up and drag him out. He and his wife and two daughters. His wife turned to a pillar of salt. And when she turned to a pillar of salt, he carried his two daughters home. Little boy one time in Sunday school, he was... Uh, the teacher's talking about Lot's wife turned and looked back and, and turned into a pillar of salt. He said, my mom was going down the street one day and, and she turned and looked back and turned into a post. Well, a lot of times you might do that, you know, by turning and looking back. I did that one time. My wife still laughs about it. I came out of a store building and I saw some people that I recognized there in automobile. I bowed my head and throwed up my hand and turned and looked back and turned back right into a post, busted my head right into a post. Now, you'll do that sometimes if you don't watch where you're going. And so we find this person down in Sodom, down there in Sodom and Gomorrah, and his wife turned into a pill of salt, and God destroyed the, the whole two cities and burned them up, dropped the atomic bomb on them, and Lot lost his whole family, his in-laws, lost everything he had but two daughters, according to the Bible. So uh, people lose their testimony they look, by looking around and sometimes getting into politics and not look where you're going. Then we come to number eight, and number eight, is one that's hypnotized by false religion. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before these whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Now false teachers, Judaizers, had come in and had tricked these Christians, and they had fallen for uh, the trickery of the Judaizers. Now, beloved, there's never been a time when there's much false religion and false teachers in the land as you find in the world today. And people are easily led into false religion. Now you better believe that. You better stay straight and stay in the book. If you belong to a good Bible-believing fundamental church where the Word of God is believed and preached, you better stick in there. Because the devil out here is doing everything he can to lead people astray and get them tied up in false doctrine and false movements. And uh, it's out there in the land and you need to stay put and serve God where the Bible is believed and preached. So we found one all tied up, been led astray by false teachers, and now he's all fouled up. Let's come to number nine. Number nine is found in the graveyard. Number nine's in the graveyard because of disobedience. In Acts chapter five, we find that Ananias and Sapphira, they were struck dead in the church because they lied to the Holy Ghost, and God killed them in the church. Well, church is so holy in those days, a lie couldn't live in it. And there when they came walking in the house of God and lied to Peter, the man of God, God struck them both dead and carried them out to the cemetery and buried them. Beloved, they're in the graveyard because they lied to the Holy Ghost. Now we find number 10. Number 10 is here in the church. You may say, preacher, where is number 10? He's sitting here in the church today. I'm glad you're among number 10. I'm glad you're in the house of God. I'm glad you're worshiping God. Now, if you're out in the radio listen to us, ought to be in God's house. You don't belong to number 10. You belong to one of the other groups. But if you're here worshiping the Lord, then you belong to number 10. Now, if there's some of you in the radio listen to us, you're disabled to go to God's house because of age and, and because you just possibly can't be there because of health and age. I'm not talking about that. You still belong to number 10 if your heart's there and would be there if you could. I'm talking about those that are disobedient that do not want to be in the house of God. They don't belong to number 10. 
Number 10 came back and fell down before Jesus down in the dirt and said, uh, Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you've done for me. Every one of us ought to be up early on Sunday morning getting ready to go to the house of God. When we go in the house of God, we ought to come in with a thankful attitude and say, thank you, Lord. You let me live another week. Thank you, God, that my family is still alive today. Thank you, Lord, you give me health and strength to labor this past week. Thank you, Lord, you gave me food and water and clothing. Thank you, Lord, that I'm able to come to the house of God. And you ought to come in God's house thankful every day that you have the privilege of coming in, especially on the Lord's Day. Come in thankful to God that you have that opportunity. Instead of trying to find some excuse like the other nine, you ought to be number 10 and come in God's house praising God every Lord's day and serve the Lord because God's been good to you. God can wipe every one of us out with one stroke. God can take everything we got with one stroke. God can take our health, our family, our wealth. God can take everything at one stroke. He allowed that to happen to Job and that could happen to anybody. And we need to realize that. Be sure that you belong to number 10. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. We thank you for number 10 that came back and bowed down before Jesus and said, Lord, I want to thank you for cleansing me. You've been so good to me. God, I pray today that you'll bless every number 10 that we have. These others we pray for, God, that they might straighten out and also become number 10. Have you in this invitation today? We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. While Debbie plays for us, there may be somebody who'd like to come forward for some reason or other. Salvation, reeducation, join the church, whatnot. She's going to play a couple of stanzas. The invitation extended to you. Would you come? Come on now, if you're not right with God. If you have been disobedient to the Lord, you've been indifferent, you've been unconcerned, you ought to come and ask God to forgive you. Would you come now while I wait? tell you this, we're dismissed. Dr. George W. Truitt had a man 64 years old saved in his church one Sunday. Dr. Truitt was blessed when he looked in his face. He had such a good countenance and he could see the expression of joy on his face. Next Sunday, Dr. Truitt tried to sing them out. He wanted to look at that bright expression again. He saw the man with his head bowed and he went back to him. He said, man, you were laughing and praising God last Sunday and happy, but why are you so sad? He said, Dr. Trude, I'm so sad. I'm 64 years old, just got saved last week. And so I went to my son, and my son said, Well, Daddy, you waited till you're 64 you, when, before you got saved. Why can't we? So I went to my grandson and said, Grandson, won't you go with Daddy to church today? He said, turned weak to his daddy and said, When we get 64 year old, Grandpa, we'll go to church. And he said, That's why I'm sad today. I'm saved and I know it, but I'm sad because the 64 years I wasted and lost my family in that respect. God help us. Let's bow our heads and Brother Barrett dismisses in prayer.